Where do I look for meaning? The student asked their teacher. Here, said the wise one. Well, when will it happen? The student asked. It's happening right now, the wise one answered. Then why don't I experience it? Because you don't look. Well, what should I look for? Nothing. Just look. Look at what? At anything your eyes light on. But must I look in a special way? No, the ordinary way will do. But don't I always look the ordinary way? No, you don't. But why ever not? Because to look, you must be here. And you are mostly somewhere else. Today is about paying attention, a practice whose power is so easily forgotten. Caught up in past memories and future fantasies without attention to the present moment, to here and now, we risk missing our lives or passing our days on the surface of existence. Often today we lament our ever shrinking attention spans. However, psychological tests that measure attention and focus have shown little change in recent decades. What's changing, according to the research, is our motivation to pay attention. Evagrius, the fourth century Christian theologian, wrote words shockingly relevant for this apparently centuries old condition. Plagued by a highly diffused attention, we give ourselves to everything lightly. In saying yes to everything, we attend to nothing. One can only love what one stops to observe. Someone once put the question to author Byron Katie How can I live in the now? To which she responded, Only in this moment are we in reality. You and everyone can learn to live in the moment as the moment, to love whatever is in front of you, to live it as you. In the constant barrage of daily stimuli of these rectangles that live in our pockets, sometimes come perfectly timed urgings like Katie's, or a meme that followed shortly after with the words of Ingrid Goff Madoff. God spoke today in a flower, and I, who was waiting on words, almost missed the conversation. Or the one that followed that one, interrupting another round of mindless scrolling. The artist Georgia O'Keeffe, who became famous for her sensuous paintings of flowers, explained her success by saying, in a way, nobody sees a flower, really. It is so small, we haven't time. And to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. Points taken. I left my phone on the couch and went outside to hear what the flowers would have me to know that day. If you have ears to hear, then hear, said Jesus. This is an invitation towards a deeper kind of listening, like the Benedictines who counseled us to listen with the ears of our hearts. It is the practice of paying attention, a, a long, loving look at the real, as early Christian mystics spoke of prayer and contemplation, to get to the essence of something, a, a deeper meaning that is missed often in mere passing glances. Perhaps this sermon so far has felt like the sower in Jesus' parable, Quotes and ideas thrown about as recklessly as mustard seeds. If these rhetorical and planting strategies feel scattered, that is their point. Knowing that we contain all kinds of grounds, if you will, take in and synthesize meaning in distinct ways, the strategy tries to make room for all. And yet, to take it as a model for paying close attention, well, that's why today I'm tossing out the traditional title of Jesus' parable, the parable of the sower, and substituting it instead 
for the parable of the unique soils or different grounds. Parables are meant to tease our minds into active thought and imagination as they conceal meanings in everyday experiences. Parables add an air of strangeness in the atmosphere like the dissonances and seemingly out-of-place notes that Stephen Sondheim introduces in Sunday, which we'll hear in just moments, taking an ordinary day and inviting us to imagine something else going on beneath our perception. Amy Gillivine says that unless Jesus' parables unsettle and provoke us in some way, we are not paying close enough attention. The invitation to be more generous and less discerning with how we share our time and resources, like the sower, it's a good word, but it doesn't necessarily provoke me. Where I am provoked is reading about the various soils and wondering which describes me, the ground of my being. The mustard seed falls first on a well-worn path and is quickly eaten up by birds. Early on in my graduate school career, intimidated by the minds that surrounded me and which I was reading, made me almost incapable of claiming my own ground. Ground occupied by the near constant parade of others' thoughts, others' voices, others' creativity. The number of citations in some of those early papers are too numerous to count, like every sentence, I'm not kidding, eating up any seeds of originality, like birds. Until a professor, the one I just mentioned, in fact, Dr. Levine, said to me, Mr. Lehman, I know what these scholars say better than you do, and I don't need your summary, but I don't know yet what you have to say. I looked at her silently, point well taken. Got it, she asked. Got it, I said. Off you go, she said as I went to write, life freshly opened. Sometimes our inability to create lives of meaning is because we too frequently compare ourselves to others. We diminish or stifle our unique beauty, wisdom, and creative expression, giving attention to that of others and very little to our own. Our sacred pathway becomes well-worn, but not by us. One of my very favorite things on this side of Divinity School as a spiritual leader is frustrating people over and over who want a clear-cut answer about the big questions or some theology or the like. I love to say, what do you think? Then I'll share my thoughts, if there's time. The good news of this parable, if anything, is that seeds of meaning find us all in abundance. None of us can claim special access to meaning or love or God. These are inherent within us. The mustard seed next reaches rocky soil. Some quickly take root, but their growth is stunted for lack of moisture. Sometimes we populate the ground of our being with anything but being. The rocks of doing, doing, doing that temporarily satisfy or that become compulsions that keep us distracted and the moisture of ever-gathering clouds that keep us anxious, unable to confront that which is needed for growth. We fear stillness and silence because of the thoughts or the pain that may arise. We need to tend a healthier, less cluttered ground from which to reflect and better pay attention, to rest in this miracle of being and bring awareness of our being to the present moment, to listen to a still small voice and the yearnings for greater wholeness and peace Simplicity, delight, and joy that lay dormant until some rains find them. Meditation, contemplation, prayer, creating something, slowing down, allowing ourselves rest, sensing our oneness with all life, sitting with a flower or a tree, moving slowly, intentionally. 
These are nourishing rains in my life. What are yours? Similarly, some of the sower's mustard mustard seeds are buried along with thorns. The two grow up together and some suffer, stifled. An obvious question this raises for us today might very well be, what or who is inhibiting our growth? Or maybe another question arises for you. How do we live with difficult people, people who annoy us, with whom we disagree profoundly, or with whom we'd rather not cooperate at all? It's a question for all of us in our shared ecosystem, this great economy of earth, sea, and sky. And the question, interestingly, plants us directly on the last ground of the parable, good soil. Maybe you're familiar with the ecstatic vision of Julian of Norwich, who prayed and prayed and prayed to know the mysteries of life and the divine. And in this, Julian writes, God showed me something small, no bigger than a hazelnut, lying in the palm of my hand. Through the eye of my understanding, I wondered, what can this be? And it was answered, it is all that is made. I was amazed that it could last, she further reflects, for I thought that because of its littleness, it would suddenly have fallen into nothing. And then I heard an answer in my understanding. It lasts and always will, because God made it, God loves it, and God preserves it. The practice of paying attention writes Barbara Brown Taylor, is as simple as looking twice at people and things you might just as easily ignore or dismiss. I tried this recently in New York City on the subway, crammed in as we were on a hot, smelly train. Every one of these people, I thought, had come from somewhere and is going somewhere, same as me. While I am sitting here thinking that I am at the center of this scene and they are on the edges, they are sitting there at the center of their own scenes with me on the edges. And every one of them is dealing with something, same as me. The one blasting a video on their phone without headphones. The one who won't or can't stop shouting. The one who looks helpless as he tries to manage three cranky young children. We are all breathing the same air for this little time. While my dominant thoughts were how quickly I could get around and away from everyone that was bothering me to no end, I remembered that a remedy for conditions like this is to pay attention to people all the more, even when they are in my way. And just for a moment, look for the human being instead of the obstacle. Or remember the hazelnut. God made them. God loves them. And may God preserve them. Or draw circles of light around people, as a Choctaw elder described prayer, praying that they might be well in body, mind, heart, and spirit. I love the hundredfold harvest Jesus says comes from good soil, the myriad possibilities that can arise from its nurturing. Reminded me of the famous words of Wendell Berry. The soil is the great connector of lives, the source and destination of all. It is the healer and restorer and resurrector by which disease passes into health, age into youth, death into life. Without proper care for it, we can have no community, because without proper care for it, we can have no life. I can imagine Jesus saying, yeah, like that. To tend the good ground and soil of our being begins in paying attention, knowing there is always more going on underneath than we can or will ever know. Paying attention leads to reverence as well. That wonderful word that reminds us that we are not gods. 
reverence, akin to awe, easy for creation, not so easy for people whose lives impinge upon our own. Feeling provoked yet? Me too. The great naturalist Louis Agassiz once said that he had spent the entire summer traveling only to get halfway across his backyard. Perhaps that is where we'll begin this summer or winter for our Southern Hemisphere friends. There is so much to discover here, now. The miracle of love comes to us in the presence of the uninterrupted moment, wrote Byron Katie. Would that it visit each of us in this moment and the next and the next, and in each find room enough to take root. Amen.